what I'll show you after this presentation, which um, Ian did mention briefly, is on the Hamilton website. Have any of you been on to there? Yeah, you can actually um, create yourself a login, which is pretty simple, and you can do a simulator. This is something that I've been doing on the unit with a lot of the um, guys to do teaching, but it's also good revision for today. So um, I'll, I'll get this up after this lecture, but you get a ventilator and they actually have ASV on there and you can see um, how to ventilate a patient with COPD, normal lungs and ARDS. So it's just a good um, bit of revision and it's also a good teaching method that we use on ITU. Right, so just before we break for coffee, um, I'm just going to share with you what we've developed on our ITU, which we're trying to um, get in use. Um, it's the refractory hypoxia pathway. So what I'm going to talk about quickly is why it's important to have this in practice. Um, just out of interest, how many units here, do you have any guidelines or anything that you use for patients that come in with hypoxia or severe ALDS? Do you have a pathway or something that you follow? You do? Wow, look at that. Amazing. <laughs> um, what about you? Where are you guys from? Uh, Mason. Mason. We've got one pretty well. Oh, okay, lovely. So it'd be quite Oh, it'd be quite good at the end actually when you yeah. see ours to compare and see what it's like. Um, and you'll see why after this lecture why it's important to have a pathway in place. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. We're just going to quickly cover our ITU <coughs> as a district general hospital and what kind of patient groups we get, the reason why it's important to have this pathway in place, and then we're going to show you the actual algorithm. So how clear does this come up? So these are our admissions um, here from 2005 through to um, 2015. So the, the most popular one, uh, the most patients we get are surgery and um, general medicine. So general medicine will cover respiratory conditions as well um, and you can see that there's an, a massive increase each year with the patients that we get last year alone we had 922 patients into our ITU um, and the reason I'm mentioning this is because one of the biggest problems facing ITU nationally is bed flow um, bed flow and bed capacity and actually um, been able to the shortage of ITU beds that we now have available so we want we basically don't want our patients sat on 70 percent oxygen for three four days before we start taking action and treat them appropriately so have all of you heard of the ITU standards ICU standards that were brought out in 2013 well, in 2015, these, this was introduced, the Guidelines and Provision of Intensive Care Services. So this is a um, co collaboration um, between all these different groups here. And this is quite a, a useful guide. So if you can see, you've got disease management, and the one that we're going to look at today is acute respiratory failure. So this provides recommendations for practice that all ICUs should be working against. You probably won't be able to read it at the back here. So there are um, six main recommendations. I won't read them all out, but a lot of these are things that we do standard on our ITU. So um, obviously, like Ian mentioned, you've got the ARDSNET criteria, so high PEEP, low tidal volume, protective lung strategies. Patients, which is quite interesting, we'll go into later, with moderate to severe ARDS, proning is now recommended. Um, Early referral to tertiary centres for ECMO, so identifying these patients and getting them treated early. But the main thing I wanted to read out was section five. So this recommendation, units should develop rescue plans for refractory hypoxemia that complement the advice of their local ECMO centres. So this was the driving force behind why we wanted to create this pathway. Um, and I don't know about you guys when you referred your patients to tertiary centres, but we found, particularly in the last few years, that they were saying to us, um, can you prone your patient and can you put them on APRV? So obviously we wanted to do it safely and have guidelines in place to manage this. I'm just going to highlight it now for me. <laughs> So, refractory hypoxia. I'm not going to go into great detail about how to define this. Um, we use the Berlin classification. Who, which units use um, millimetres of mercury on their blood gases? Anyone? Is everyone use kilopascals? Yeah, OK. Um, so you have mild, um, moderate to severe ARDS. Is this something everyone's familiar with? 
Yep, so uh, mild is less than 300 millimetres of mercury. You've got moderate, which is less than 200, or severe ARDS, which is less than 100. So in kilopascules, that would be less than 13 kilopascules. And this is the group of patients that we want to identify and put a management plan in place. So obviously we use um, best practice, um, the guidelines that are available to us, and one approach. Now what I mean by one approach is obviously we have a lot of different consultants working in the ITU, we have a lot of different modes of ventilations available, and I'm sure we all know when they swap weeks, one of them might come in and think, well, let's try the patient on this mode if that one isn't working. So what we wanted to do with developing this pathway is have a standardised approach that we can follow so patients get good continuity of care. So when we developed our guidelines, what we ideally wanted was just an A4 piece of paper. I don't know if that's what yours is like, that you've... <laughs> so we wanted something, uh, just an algorithm really, something easy, simple to follow um, for all members of the staff, not just the senior team, but junior nurses as well. Obviously looking at the best practice, and we've gone over the guidelines and what... Um, what the, standard, the best standards are, and obviously your local facilities. So for instance, we can't do ECMO at a DGH, but what we can do is prone our patients and use advanced modes of ventilation. So you've got to look at what facilities you've got available. And then the main thing is safety. So days like today for training to improve awareness, teaching, um, and just general knowledge for the staff on the unit. So we're going to have a look at our pathway. I'm going to split it into sections so you can actually, we can break it down and you can see it a bit clearer. Have any of you, obviously I know, obviously you're using it, has anyone seen this before? Because I know in February we, we sent a lot of these pathways out. Um, so we wanted it simple to follow, um, that we can use at the bedside. So the first section is identifying your patients. Well, we all know the patients that we get in um, to ITU, the ones that are put on a ventilator. Um, they've got very poor PF ratios, high oxygen requirements. So here it's got actually moderate to severe. So this isn't just a severe category, but as soon as your patient is identified that they've got a moderate ARDS, we would look at putting them on this pathway. Um, just common sense things would be the next thing. So do your bedside respiratory assessment. So auscultate the chest, um, you know, are they plugging off, is the tube blocked, um, have they got wheeze, secretions, pneumothorax, just the basic things that we can do to rule out why, why they're not oxygenating. And then what we'd normally do when we put the patient on the ventilator, so lung protective strategies. Now, I do apologise, Ian, we haven't actually got ASV up there as a mode, but um, I will add it on because we do use ASV. <laughs> So any conventional method to ventilate a patient, um, as long as they're lung protective strategies. Dry lungs. Have any of you ever rung your tertiary centre and they say with these patients, um, diurese them or get them onto the filter to dry them out? And this is what they're saying to us now, um, to try and dry your patient out earlier. That can be particularly difficult if you've got a very septic, unstable patient where you're chucking in loads of fluids. Um, rule out intracardiac shunt with either a bedside echo or TOE just to find out other reasons why they might not be oxygenating. And then the last step here, the recruitment manoeuvre. So this is quite important because what we've learned over the last year or two since using APRV and proning, um, whether they're recruitable or not makes a big difference on the pathway to which one we use. So. Um, Mark, one of our ITU consultants, will be talking about PV recruitment later. But this is the second section of our algorithm. So if you've got your patient on conventional ventilation, and after 6 to 12 hours, um, there doesn't seem to be an improvement, when you do your PV recruitment, you want to find out two things. One, you want to see if they're recruitable. Um, and if they have got recruitable lung, then what we do in our unit is put them onto a recruitment mode of ventilation, which is APRV. And just from experience, we often find, who here actually uses APRV in practice? Yeah. And have you found patients, if you say on 100% oxygen, when you've put them onto APRV, what do you tend to find happens? Yeah, that's it. So normally, Within the six hours, if a patient's on 100% oxygen, you've put them onto APRV, 
normally you'd expect that that FI2 would be below 50 within that period. Have you ever had patients where that hasn't happened? Yeah. And what do you do? Oh, uh, okay. Right, so what we found um, from experience is that if their oxygen requirements don't come down within this period, then actually it probably means they haven't got a recruitable lung. So APRV isn't going to work. So what you need to do is prone the patient. And I think, um, well, Natalie will be able to tell you later, she had a great example of this yesterday when a patient came in, put them straight onto APRV, and with two hours they were prone because they were unable to ventilate, oxygenate, and they were unrecruitable. Um, and then showed an improvement. And it is about clinical judgment, so you don't have to stick to these time scales. So if you know you've got a patient in, they're not responding, they're not recruitable, then you, we would prone. Would you prone and use APRV at the same time? Does anyone do that? We do, and we found actually it's worked really well. Because once you prone the patient, you change the way their VQ mismatch. You, um, I won't go into too much, I don't want to take over your presentation, Natalie. But actually, while they're prone, APRV recruits the patient. And what we've found is once they're flipped back, um, then there's no need to reprone. They actually do really well. Now, when you get to this point, we would obviously always refer to a tertiary centre um, for ECMO advice. And we've been auditor auditing the data over the last year. Um, and they, they tend to say, just follow what you're doing. You're doing the right steps. But we'd also uh, we'd always make them aware of um, obviously the sick patients. Any questions? No. Well, hopefully from this you can see the importance of why it's it's good to have um, an algorithm in place. One to identify these patients because we don't want them sat on a ventilator, getting further lung injuries on high oxygen. Um, so you want to identify them quickly and obviously have a good management plan in place. So this may be something you guys can take back to your own units. Um, and we'd be happy to share the pathway with you if, you, if that's something you want to take back. Um, but I'll, I'll give you my email address at the end. Right.